uh, the humble Amiga 500, by far the most popular model of the Amiga range. And it is quite hard to track down exact sales figures, but it is estimated on the lower end that around 1.5 million of these were sold, and on the high end, around four and a half million. Either way, every kid at my school had an Amiga 500 back in the early 90s. And for most people, it is the first machine they think of when you talk about the Amiga. And in recent years, we've had lots of options for speeding up and hugely upgrading the Amiga machines from FPGA solutions like the Vampire, which I did demo on the Amiga 600 on this channel a few years ago, and is now available in standalone form and for other Amigas as well, like the A500 and the A1200. And recently, I did a video on the high-end Warp 1260 accelerator for the Amiga 1200. Again, another high-end, really powerful and incredible card, but these expansions do come in at quite a big cost. Now, don't get me wrong, I think for you know the small run of these cards that they do and the power they pack in, they are actually worth the price. But obviously, it does put it out of reach of many hobbyists and people that haven't got you know insane amounts of money to throw at 30-year-old hardware. But today, we're going to be looking at a powerful Amiga accelerator with the equivalent performance of around a 70 to 80 megahertz 030 with heaps of RAM and better graphics that will set you back around 11 pounds. Seriously. And this, of course, is made possible using the Raspberry Pi. Now, Amiga fan Cloud Schwartz has come up with this ingenious open source project, which enables you to harness the power on board a Raspberry Pi and give the Amiga access to its resources by replacing the Amiga 500 CPU. And at the time of recording this video at the end of April 2021, the Pi Storm only currently works with the Amiga 500 and the A2000, possibly the CDTV as well. I might have to give that a try. But there are people working on adapting the Pi Storm to work with other models as well. Now, I've got to give a big shout to Lamaru, who was kind enough to send me this Assemble Pi Storm. And I know he's currently working on trying to get this running on an Amiga 600. So how does it work exactly? Well, the instructions for making your own Pi Storm can be found on their GitHub. So that means you can use a PCB manufacturer, for example, our sponsor, PCBWay, or you can join one of their group buys on their Discord server when they become available. Now, unfortunately, at the time of recording this, there is a global chip shortage, and that means the main chip on board of the uh, Pi Storm is proving quite hard to find. But I'd suggest you jump onto their Discord, keep an eye on there, uh, fill in their form to become part of one of the group buys, and then when things become available again, you'll be the first to find out. And it looks like they're trying to sort out builders from different regions, and, you know, being an open source project, I'm sure before for long, there are going to be people selling these at cost on places like Amibay, but obviously nip onto their Discord, I'll link that up in the video description. And just before we take a closer look and get the Pi Storm set up and installed, I wanted to take just a moment to give a big thank you to this video sponsor, my wonderful friends at PCB Way. Now, if after watching this video, you want to get your own Pi Storm board made or a board for another project you're working on, give them a try. They offer a full feature custom PCB prototype service with more than a decade in the field, offering low cost, fast turnaround, quality boards and they are massive supporters of the retro community so check them out at pcbway.com and a big thank you to pcbway for supporting my channel now as well as a pi storm you're also going to need a raspberry pi now currently the project is only designed to work on a specific model and that is the raspberry pi 3a plus which i don't actually have i did order one of amazon but unfortunately it hasn't arrived in time for this video but i do have a 3b which actually won't work as if you look here it um fits on this way because of the usb ports it physically will not fit onto the Raspberry Pi 3B, but you can use a GPIO port riser. Um, and I've got one here. This set me back around eight pounds off Amazon. So then if we just connect that to the GPIO port there, and as you can see, that actually gives me um, quite a few GPIO ports. We only need one of them, but then I can connect the Pi Storm to the top one here and it will fit just fine. Admittedly, this combination is quite tall, so that does mean I'm not going to be able to close the Amiga 500's case. Um, but obviously, if you get a 3A, that will fit fine inside, and the whole thing will be a lot tidier. 
And the Pi Storm itself is actually a very tidy and compact design. Now, as I showed, then you've got the GPIO connector to connect up to the Raspberry Pi. The main component on the board is this Intel Altera Max 2 complex programmable logic device, a CPLD, which is non-volatile, and that means you can save data to it, which is retained after power off, which is obviously important for a CPU replacement as you don't wanna to have to reprogram it every time you turn off your Amiga. And then on the bottom, we have the pins there that will plug straight into the CPU socket on the Amiga 500. Now there are several guides online with various different ways of doing this. You can do it via SSH on a headless Raspberry Pi, for example, but I've got a keyboard and a second monitor. So it's gonna be a bit easier to show on video by connecting the Raspberry Pi up to its own screen. So then we can see what's going on. So I've got a USB keyboard, a nice sun branded one. Why not? Um, I've also got an ethernet cable as well. You could obviously configure this using Wi-Fi, but I've got, you know, an ethernet port nearby. And I've got my A500 Plus open on the desk and I've removed the 68K CPU. So we can plug the Pi Storm straight into the Amiga before we power anything on. Now, obviously we need to make sure that we get the orientation right. And you can see there is a little notch on the end of the Pi Storm, which lies up with the socket notch on the motherboard. And we don't need a power supply as the Raspberry Pi will actually take its power directly from the Amiga. And of course, we're gonna need an SD card. Now, it is suggested that you use the light version of Raspberry Pi OS, as the windowing system on the full version adds system load, which will then slow down performance. And you can download the official Raspberry Pi imager from their website, which again, I'll link up in the description. Select the light version and then write that to your SD card. Then we can transplant the SD card into the Raspberry Pi and power on the Amiga. Now you will see that the Raspberry Pi will come to life, but at this stage, the Amiga won't. And that's fine, that's completely normal. First, we need to configure the Raspberry Pi to run the CPU emulation software. Now it will take a bit longer on the first boot of the Raspberry Pi to resize the file system, but after that, you'll be greeted with the login. Now the default username is Pi, and the password will be Raspberry. Now, of course, the first thing that you always do with any project on the Raspberry Pi is to make sure that everything is up to date. So we'll type in sudo apt get update, and that will then make sure that all our system files are the latest versions. And this might take a couple of minutes, but after it's done, we'll then need to install the direct media layer development files. Now, it's not important that you know what's going on here. I will actually put all of these commands and the full instructions in the video description. You can just follow them one by one and then it will get to the stage where you can run this. So again, all these instructions one by one, you can copy and paste them straight from the, the video description. But essentially we're installing the direct media layer development files and then we're gonna do a git clone of the uh, PyStorm project and then we're gonna make that. Now that we've done that, the next stage is to do the FPGA bitstream update. Now, again, you don't need to know what's going on here. Just copy the commands. Uh, we need to install the on-chip debugger. So we get that by doing sudo apt get install open OCD. And then there are some shell scripts in here. We need to change the protection bits on those to make them executable. Again, just copy these commands and they will work. And then depending on which version of the PyStorm board you have, you'll either do um, sudo nprog.sh or nprog240 if you've got a revision B, um, which I have. So again, I mean, if one doesn't work, the other one probably will. Run these commands, and then if no errors are displayed on the screen, you'll see a message saying shut down command invoked. And that means that the CPLD has been programmed successfully, and we should be ready to give this a try in its most basic configuration. So now we can type in sudo dot slash emulator, hit return, and you will see the Amiga comes to life. And we have successfully got the Pi Storm up and running. Now, obviously we're booted into the most basic Pi Storm configuration here, but I thought I'd just quickly boot up the Amiga Workbench from Floppy and launch sysinfo, as I know everyone's gonna be asking to see it in the comments. <laughs> Even though, yeah, it's not the most accurate benchmarking tool, I will run something a bit more thorough for those who love a bit of benchmarking porn at the end. But for now, let's just launch sysinfo from this floppy disk I've got here. And bearing in mind we're only emulating an 020 at the moment, I can 
beef that up to an 030 in just a bit and as you can see the uh, the 020 is recognized there um and it reckons that we have yeah these stats are probably not very accurate uh let's just go down and click on the speed test here and see what it reports And there you go. Now the red bar at the top is this machine. And as you can see, for a comparison at the moment, it reckons that we are running around 26.2 times faster than a stock Amiga 500 slash 600, as it's shown as on here. Um, and almost up to the speed of an A4000, um, a bit quicker than the A3000, actually quite a bit quicker, I believe three times faster. Um, I'd ignore these figures over here. <laughs> the records are running at 396 megahertz. That is blatantly false. Um, but as you can see, you know, this gives it a very nice speed boost. Um, 26 times quicker than stock for, you know, an adapter that's going to set you back around 11 pounds. And if we quit here as well in Workbench, you can see all that lovely RAM that is available at the top of the screen there. Um, 134 megabytes of memory free and uh, the 1.5 chip RAM that I've got inside this Amiga 500 Plus. So already, you know, it's most basic for the price, you know, not factoring in the Raspberry Pi, which again, you can pick up for around 25 pounds. This gives you a great little increase in power on your Amiga 500 for a very low price. Now, of course, the downside to this is when I power off the Amiga and then turn it back on, the Raspberry Pi is also going to reboot and we have to go through the entire launching the emulator process from scratch. So right now we're going to jump back onto the Raspberry Pi and automate that because the goal of this is I want the board to be inside the Amiga and then when I turn the A500 on, the Raspberry Pi comes on automatically boots up into the emulator and then the Amiga starts around 30 seconds later. So let's get that configured now. Okay, so we're back at the Raspberry Pi login screen now. I'm going to log in using the same credentials, Pi and Raspberry. And now we want to run the configuration tool. So we don't have to log in each time we want it to do it on its own. So we'll use sudo. Oops, did that wrong. sudo raspi config and there we go we can see some system options here so we're going to system options boot slash auto login so we want to automatically log in as the pi user with the text console we'll select that there we go and we can also put the display down to um something a bit more manageable maybe like 720p um, which might screw up my capture card, so I won't do it here. But yeah, if you want a bit more performance at your Pi, you could do that. And you can also set up your networking here as well. Now, apparently they are working on networking support for um, Pi Storm, but it's not enabled as yet. So, I mean, I've got an Ethernet cable in here for now. I should probably enable that, though, because I want to put SSH enabled too. So that will mean I can then transfer files over Wi-Fi to the uh, SD card inside the Raspberry Pi when the machine's all closed up. So we'll go into interface options, there we go. SSH, we want to enable that. Yep, enable that. There we go. Then we can SSH into it over the network now. We also need to set the wireless country settings as well, so it will uh, find the correct Wi-Fi channels. So I'll go down and do that quickly in here. It's always hard when you live in the UK. Is it going to be GB, UK? There we go. <laughs> Okay, and now I should be able to enter my Wi-Fi network SSID, which is Paris. And there we go. Now, if we do a reboot, this should automatically log in. And if we quickly jump onto my Windows PC, you can see that I've been setting up a very basic hard disk image using WinUAE, the Amiga emulator for Windows. And a big shout out to our Mark Seeley for his help with this bit of the process. And actually doing it is quite simple. Um, there are lots of guides online to making hard disk files in WinUAE. It's a bit beyond the scope of this video, but you know, do a YouTube search and you'll find it. So what I've got here is a basic Workbench 3.1 install, and I've installed WHD Load and a couple of games here as well so we can play them directly from the hard disk and actually doing this inside 
and WinUAE is really straightforward and actually a lot easier than doing it on a real Amiga because anything you download from the internet, you can literally just drag and drop the zip files into the window and it will mount them on the Amiga. So that means you can then just drag and drop and copy them over a lot easier than, you know, trying to do it on a real system. So now that I've got that hard disk image file, we need to copy that over to the Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to close that there and we're going to be using a program called WinSCP. So if I double click this here, and then we need to select the SCP protocol and the host name will be the IP address of the Raspberry Pi. So mine, obviously it'll be different for you. Mine is 192.168.86.54. And then username and password, same as on the Pi. So it's Pi and Raspberry. And then if we log in, we should be able to connect to the Pi, and there we are. It's actually dropped me into the uh, home slash Pi directory. Um, so then, that's the file there, Pi. Uh, mine is pi 0 htf with a lowercase i. It's important you remember the, uh, the case as well, because that is important. Go over to there, and then I can just drag and drop it into the Pi Storm window. We'll overwrite the one I made before. This will take a couple of minutes to copy over depending on your network speed. I mean, the, uh, the Raspberry Pi's Wi-Fi isn't the quickest. So give it a couple of minutes and then we should be able to get it up and running on the Amiga. Okay, in a minute or so later, the file has copied over the network and should now be on the Raspberry Pi. So let's make sure we're in the right directory. We'll do CD home slash Pi slash Pi Storm. And we'll type LS to do a directory listing. And there we can see it there uh, near the end pi 0hdf which is what we need. Now we need to quickly edit the config file to enable the uh, virtual SCSI device and also to point it towards that hard disk image file. So we'll type in nano which is the editor program that we'll use for this and then we want to edit the uh, default.cfg file. So if you type in def then hit tab it should find it. And while we're in here actually we can change the CPU from the config file. So um, as you can see at the moment, it is set to be an 020. We can even put it up to an 040 or a, an 060. Um, I think that we'll stick with an 030. So we'll bump it up a little bit. Um, that really is, you know, the sweet spot for playing games on the Amiga, I find. Um, you know, that is if you want to play games that are a bit more advanced than just standard Amiga 500 games. Then if we scroll down, we want to use this here, uh, the Pi SCSI. So we need to just uncomment that by removing the hash at the start. And then we'll remove the one here where it says set ver um, Pi SCSI zero. And we need to change that. By default, it's PI zero with a capital I, but I've actually given mine a lowercase. Like I said, it's case sensitive. So that should find it now. And then we'll press Control and X and that will save it. We'll say yes. And now that should all be set up. So we will run the emulator again. And the Amiga should come to life and hopefully boot from the hard disk image. There you go, simple as that. Now that's not to say that the Pi Storm is flawless at the moment. Obviously this is still very early development and the team are constantly working on improving this. Um, just checking out their Discord today, I mean, so many ideas are flowing in there on ways they can add new features and improve bugs. And there is actually one, um, I'd say quite major bug that I've found so far, and that is the fact that most games of floppy disk don't seem to work using the Pi Storm. For example, I've got three games here that just came with my Amiga 500 Plus in the Cartoon Classics pack. Um, if I insert that into the disk drive and give the machine a reboot and try to load Lemmings, um, I was a bit confused because the game started to load, kind of got towards a bit when it was going to load the menu, and then the machine just hangs. So I thought maybe it's something to do with, you know, not working with an 020 or an 030, but then I got this disk booting fine on my Amiga 3000, my A4000, that expect a lot higher than this machine here. And I thought maybe it's a problem with the disk. I made another ADF file, tried the original and a copy. Again, both did the same thing. As you'll see here, when it gets past the DMA design logo, it should then attempt to load the Lemmings menu to let you get into the game. But instead we get a black screen and the system just completely hangs. And I wonder whether it was some issue with, you know, track disc loaders, because another game we've got here, Captain Planet, and I have left this for like, you know, half an hour before. It's not me being <laughs> hasty and quick here, but for the purposes of a video, this is as far as it gets, trust me. 
And to prove it's not just lemmings, I've put Captain Planet in there as well. And again, it will start to load. We can see the, uh, the borders there in dark blue. And now the machine is hung. Same with Bart versus the Space Mutants. It's the same with this and pretty much all the track disc games that I've tried to load on it. Um, yeah, that just ticked once and now black screen. I've mentioned this in the Discord and they are aware of this problem. And apparently it's something to do with um, the machine currently thinking it's got several floppy drives attached to it rather than just one. Um, so they haven't really had a chance to look into that properly yet, but they are aware of it. But just a little heads up if your main idea with getting a Pie Storm was to play Mega Floppy Disk games. At the moment, they don't tend to work very well at all, in my experience. But obviously, I mean, if you've got this solution, most people will use WHD Load, which every game I've tried on there so far has worked flawlessly. And I know the team are looking into this, so hopefully it will be a bug that they can uh, track down and fix very soon. But I thought, it, you know, it was important that I pointed that out to people just in case. You did what I did and uh, spent hours thinking, have I set something up wrong? Just so you're reassured, it doesn't work that well with floppy games at the moment. And the final thing I want to try out on the Pi Storm is the RTG support. Now, RTG, which stands for Retargetable Graphics, is usually limited to the big box Amigas, and it means you can get loads more colors, higher screen resolutions, and you can output the Amiga display via the Raspberry Pi's HDMI port. Now, to do this, we need to copy a few files over to the Amiga, and there is a full in-depth guide on their GitHub, on the PyStorm GitHub that I will link to in the video description to talk you through it all. Um, but really, it's quite straightforward. You need to download Picasso 96 from Aminet. I then copied that onto my hard disk file, and again, loads of guides on setting up um, Picasso 96 as well. Then we need the drivers for the Pi Storm, and that is actually already in the package. So we can just move that to the Amiga, and I can do that in WinUAE again. And using WinSCP, you will find the drivers directory inside the platforms slash Amiga slash RTG folder. So the way I did it was by using WinSCP to copy that to my Windows machine, zip it up quickly, drag it into WinUAE, so it's on my hard disk image, along with Picasso 96, and then copy that new hard disk image back to the Raspberry Pi, and then do the setup process on there. And they're actually, to make things easier, Picasso settings you can download from their Discord server, stickied into the main channel, and there is a nice walkthrough on their GitHub as well. So then all you need to do is open the config file again, uncomment out the RTG variable in there, and you can even do this from uh, WinSCP and save it directly as well. And then on the Amiga, opening the screen modes, you will see a new list of uh, glorious high resolution screen modes. If I click this one here, you can see we've now got a lovely 720p workbench, millions of colors available, and I can display that via HDMI on my modern Samsung monitor. And they're actually working on an adapter to allow the Amiga's native modes to be output via the Raspberry Pi's HDMI as well, so you won't need two monitors. And also while I was doing this, I've upgraded the uh, ROM to be Kickstart 3.1, and that is again really simple. All you do is uh, copy the file, rename it to kick.rom, and drop that into the PyStorm directory, and um, enable that in the config, and the Amiga will boot up with an upgraded Kickstart ROM. And this video actually took me a few days to make, and in the meantime, my Raspberry Pi 3A Plus has arrived from Amazon, so we can swap out the 3B, and we don't need that um, GPIO riser. That will mean that there is room to put the keyboard on top of the Raspberry Pi and close the Amiga's case, which we'll do in just a moment. Now, obviously, before we seal the Amiga's case, we want to make sure that the Raspberry Pi boots directly into the emulator on power on. That means we can disconnect the keyboard and HDMI cable and uh, close the Amiga's case. So to do that, we can just add the emulator to the rc.local file. Now, this practice is somewhat frowned upon in the Linux community from what I know, but you know, it will work. It is a quick and easy hack, dead easy to do. And obviously, you can still SSH into the Pi over Wi-Fi if you need to stop it or change anything. And a big thank you to Chris Edwards for this tip in his recent Pi Storm video. Definitely worth checking that out. So to do that, dead easy. Um, in the command line here, we just do cd slash etc. And then in here, sudo nano rc.local. And this is a sequence of commands that are executed when the Raspberry Pi boots. So before the exit command here, we just need to do cd slash home slash 
pi slash pi storm to get us into the right directory. And then we want to uh, run the emulator. So sudo dot slash emulator. Now we can do control and X. We want to overwrite that Y return. And there we go. And now we can reboot the Raspberry Pi and it should automatically load the emulator without us having to log in or type any commands. And that will mean that I can uh, disconnect the keyboard, close the Amiga's case, and it should launch the emulator automatically. So that's been a quick look at the Pi Storm as it stands now. Now, obviously this is an ongoing open source effort, so you can expect improvements over the coming months. I know, for example, that they're currently working on getting the Raspberry Pis networking to be available to the Amiga. So you can get the Amiga online via the Pi's Wi-Fi and allowing you to use the Pi's USB ports for the Amiga as well. But already at this stage, I mean, for such an affordable price, this is just mind blowing. You know, if you were to buy all of these real components separately, 128 megs of RAM, a 30 accelerator, a hard disk interface, a kickstart upgrade, RTG graphics, and soon, you know, network and USB ports, that would easily set you back over 1500 pounds. And I know that because I've got all that in my Amiga 4000 and it wasn't cheap, but getting this complete setup in an Amiga 500 for under 50 pounds, including the Raspberry Pi 3A, I just think is incredible. So hats off to the team who are working on the Pi Storm project. Really, really exciting. And it's a great time to be an Amiga fan at the moment. So many incredible new developments coming out. I can't wait to see what they do with this. So if you've got any questions, of course, you can leave a video comment. Maybe you've got a Pi Storm and you've been trying it out. I'd love to know what you think of it or um, maybe any other upgrades that you've done to your Amigas recently. So many options out there right now. Thank you very much for watching this video. I will see you in the next one. And just a quick reminder that I do a weekly retro gaming and technology podcast. You can get it every Friday, new episodes featuring an industry legend on the show each week as well. And you can download it from your favorite podcast client or from our website, theretrohour.com. And while you're here on YouTube, here are another couple of videos I think you might enjoy. Take care. I will see you next time.